Welcome to Dare to Leap, a conversation and community supporting women just like you to gain the freedom, flexibility, and financial security you desire and deserve with CEO and founder of Virtual Expert Training, Kathy Guggenauer. This is Dare to Leap, and now here's the powerhouse tiara-wearing Kathy Guggenauer. I am excited to introduce you to our guest today. It is Kevin Schmidlin. And I believe I pronounced his name right. We'll ask him in just a second here. (laughs) Oh, yay, I did. Okay. Kevin is a podcaster and a podcast coach. Woohoo. I think I should have had Kevin as one of my first guests (laughs) rather than like my 40th guest because he could have given me some tips and we're going to get some tips from him today. He launched his first podcast in 2018 as a side hobby. And a little over a year later, he took that show past 100,000 downloads and $100,000 monetized. Woo, that's the kind of numbers we like to hear. Now he helps other podcasters do the same thing through Grow the Show, a podcast to help podcasters grow their podcast. Super Meta. Who, Kevin, super meta. I love it. Love everything about it. And I love your title, Grow the Show. Welcome. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm, I'm hopeful to uh, share as much value as I can. Yeah. So you look really, really young. Are you as young as you look? Well, I'm 29. So I don't know if that's how young. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so when I was 29, I thought, oh, my gosh, I am so old. How did I get this old? And I got really depressed at 30. Yeah. How are you feeling about it? So the oldest I ever felt was when I was 22, right out of college, because all of my friends were still in college. And then later that year, I joined a chorus actually in my home city of Philadelphia uh, with 80 singers. And uh, most of them are over 50. (laughs) And so I pretty soon found that a lot of my closest friends are decades older, 30s, 40s, 50s, sometimes 60s and 70s. And so at that point, and ever since then, I've felt super young, which has been great because it's made me totally, like I said, at 22, I thought I was so old and life was over, which is hilarious. But that's how you, in your 20s, you think life is over for some reason. Like our culture makes us think that life doesn't matter after 20. But for me, like I'm grateful to have had the experience. They gave me the perspective. They live these incredible youthful lives at 70, 80 years old. And I'm like, oh, I got time, man. (laughs) Oh, that is a wonderful perspective to have because, yeah, I, I'll tell you, at 64, um, I feel younger than ever. I really Fantastic. do. I, I literally feel younger than I felt at 30 Amazing. and happier. That's the other thing that I'm sure you've heard from a lot of your friends, which is um, you really do get happier as you age, which is just absolutely awesome because there's got to be some plus sides to getting older. <laughs> yeah. I, well, I'd love to ask you about mindset <laughs> stuff, but but this is your show. <laughs> yeah. You can that. interview me on your Grow the Show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But <laughs> so um, did you ever work in a corporate job? So when I you did. were 22, you just got out of college? That's right. So right out of college, I got a software developer job at a big health insurance company. It was the dream job, you know, big, big company paid well. Um, You know, I was in an early career development program, which was great. I mean, I loved still, I mean, some of my best friends in the world are still the folks that I worked with at that company. Um, And I was there for four years, but I pretty quickly realized that corporate life really wasn't for me. You know, I I just kind of it didn't really light me up writing software, insurance software, <laughs> you know, believe it or not. Um, and so Ooh, yeah. shocking. Yeah. I think, I think it was like six months into my corporate pr- career. I started working on like side hustles in the hope that, you know, one of them would blow up. And I later learned that things don't blow up. It's you that does it, but it took me a while to learn that. And that's kind of the journey that I would eventually go on. But yeah, I started in corporate um, for the first four years. And I thought for a long time that that's what I wanted until I had it. <laughs> Yeah. So um, did you go into corporate because at that time, that's what society expected of you or your parents or what what made you think corporate was the way to go? Yeah, it was. I mean, and it just seemed to be what you were supposed to do, like, you know, go to college. And and so I come from a family. My father's a crane operator. My mom is when I was raised, she was stay at home and then went back to school and became a teacher. Um, and so the values that I was raised with were get a stable job stability, like particularly with my dad's construction job, um, we would get hit with recessions two years after the recession. Cause it takes that Ooh. long for like the construction planning to happen. And when we, when there was a recession, we would get hit hard. And so 
I was raised to, you know, go for stability, which I do not. That's great. That's a great value to have, right? Like I don't (laughs) like that is a great thing. And I'm incredibly grateful for my childhood and my upbringing. Um, And so that's what I did. That's what I went for. And it was more than my parents. Like truly that was like people were like, you are successful if you get a great job. Right. And, and that's what I subscribed to. That's what I believed. Cause that's what was surrounded. That, that's what surrounded me. Um, and so that's exactly why. And, you know, I, I aim to please. Uh, and so early, at that point in life, I didn't realize that I, there are, so, you know, you have to make yourself happy first before you can make everybody else happy. Um, grateful, gratefully, I came to that conclusion. And what's funny is that when I left the corporate gig, um, I thought that everyone in my life was going to, uh, was going to, I I would get scorned from them. Right. Because I was breaking that society, you know, that societal mold, but what blew my mind was that everybody congratulated me. Like when I said I was leaving the corporate job and they were like, Oh man, you're so lucky. And I'm like, what? And, and what I realized is that nobody in my life actually was mad or like actually wanted this for me. It's just what I thought they wanted, you know, it's all in my head, which was crazy. It was crazy. That is. So um, what made you decide to leave the corporate job? Yeah. So I knew that I wanted to be entrepreneurial, always had designs on being entrepreneurial. And so I was that kid that, that had side hustles and I had a bunch of them that failed before I actually did take the leap. And the first one was a lot of them were apps, right? Cause I was in software. Um, the one that got the most traction was <laughs> was a social media app. It was geolocated digital pinatas. <laughs> and believe oh it or not. Oh my God, I love that. <laughs> right. And it was fun. I mean, we got 500 that users on the app. We had a bunch of businesses in Philadelphia that were using it and like doing promotions and stuff. And it was really, really cool. But <laughs> about what, three months after that launched, me and my co-founder realized that we weren't actually all that passionate about geolocated digital pinatas, believe it or not. And so we, <laughs> we, put, <laughs> we put that on hold and said, all right, let's not do that. And it was on to the next side hustle. And what's funny is it was a few months after that, that I started, that I had the idea for my first podcast, which is about my home city of Philadelphia. And what's funny is that was the first side hustle that I didn't at first plan to that, to that be the big thing that would blow up. And that would be this company that I would, you know, own and stuff like that. I just wanted to do that because it seemed fun. And I figured I'd, you know, make a podcast, get to meet, you know, some incredible people as I interviewed and like make a show that people like. And while I figure out what the real side hustle thing will be. And then of course, Mm -hmm. as life goes, that wound up being the thing. (laughs) So, Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, it was about, so I had the idea for the show Philly who in late 2017, um, took three months figuring out using the internet to learn how to make a podcast, right? What mic do you use? How do you make a feed? That sort of thing. Like most of most podcasters figure it out. That's how we usually do it. And then, uh, launched the show in May of 2018. Day one, it did really well. Got 250 downloads. Um, it was, I was like, I thought I had made it, right? So I was like, I did it, guys. This is it. I'm this incredible podcast entrepreneur. And I gave <laughs> notice, actually. And I left the job two months later uh, to do the podcast full time. Now I can tell you why. Now, in retrospect, huge mistake. <laughs> it's worked out. <laughs> but... It was very premature because it was four years of being unhappy in the corporate world and like four or five failed ventures. And I was just, I had savings. and I was just so ready to be an entrepreneur that I was like, this is it. I got it. And I jumped. Wouldn't change that for the world right now. Cause it want like, I wound up having my back up against the wall and it forced me to learn the things that I now teach other people. Um, but that's how I left because <laughs> I was just so after four years of something not sticking, I kind of just did it and took the leap. Um, and I'm grateful that I did but I wouldn't necessarily recommend doing it the same way. (laughs) So what would you recommend to people? Yeah. So my recommendation is to, so at that point I'll I'll first tell kind of what the story was and then I'll, I'll say kind of what I, what I think would be better, would have been better to do. Um, So I I left the job and, and then I had a bunch of savings just saved up because I was, you know, young, making good money, doing software development, and uh, always wanted to be an entrepreneur. So I knew that I had to, you know, bank some cash because entrepreneurship, you know, doesn't, they say what it takes a, a thousand days for your entrepreneur, you know, after taking the leap in the entrepreneurship for it to like st- replace your previous income. Um, and so I had, I didn't have a thousand days worth, but I had about three to six months worth of savings. And so I took the leap. And then for three months, I was living large. I was living the dream, spending full time working on my podcast, interviewing the coolest people in Philadelphia 
Um, and, and that was it. That was all I was doing. And I was spending like 40 to 60 hours a week, but it was fun. I was having a blast. But unfortunately, I didn't know how to reliably get more listeners for the podcast because I was using word of mouth and my social, my personal social network. And then that was kind of it. And what I later learned was that the, the huge um, numbers that I saw after launch is what I call the launch buzz. So when a podcast first launches, it has a certain buzz around it, right? And it gets word of mouth much easier. And it also gets the, um, the social network of the host jumps in. And so it looks like it's growing really fast, but what happens is word of mouth, people only share a show when they discover a show. So if your show stops growing, word of mouth is going to stop because people don't share a show that they've been listening to for six months. They share a show that they just discovered last week. You know what I mean? And so word of, if word of mouth stops, it doesn't start again. And, and I had tapped out my social media network completely. And so I had no ways to get strangers to fall, find out about the show. So I didn't know how to do that. I also didn't know how to monetize. I didn't know when, I didn't know how I, it just was at some point, maybe somebody like advertisers will just start beating down the door because my show is so popular and I won't be able to keep the money away. Right. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> so I found that I had already taken the leap, uh, running out of savings, spending more time working on the, sh I was having fun with it, working on the show, but I was spending more time than I was with my corporate job and I wasn't making any money. And you know, at that point, that's when my back was up against the wall. And so what I wound up doing was I broke the almighty consistency rule of my podcast and put the show on hold for six weeks and said, I'm going to stop releasing and I'm going to see if I can figure out how to actually do this. Because every time I Google how to grow a podcast, it gives me this advice. And I see the same advice on every single blog post about this. And none of this stuff is working. So I took some time, took a pause studied, took courses, read books, got in touch with as many you know podcasters as I could. I took one weekend and listened to every single podcast on the Apple top 100 just to see what the Oh my God, were. I can't even imagine. That's a lot of podcasts. It was, <laughs> and it was a whole weekend and it was just kind of, I just walked around the city of Philadelphia. I must've walked like 20 miles that weekend, just listening to these shows. And like, I had a notebook with me and I was taking notes on like, what are the, what are they all doing the same across different genres? What are the patterns? Like, how are people like plugging, you know, new listeners? How, do they have Patreons? Like just everything. What are these people who have, who are doing the thing that I want to do? What are they doing? Uh, like I said, read books, took courses. And through this like six week intensive period, which again, it was, a, it was a privilege to be able to take that six weeks. I'll fully admit that most people wouldn't have that opportunity. I did through, a, a, you know, my, my savings and everything like that. Um, but I was able to do this. And what I learned is that the, Internet is very good at teaching you how to launch a show, but the internet is very bad at teaching you how to grow a show. And in fact, most of the advice that the internet gives you doesn't get you new listeners. And in fact, it actually just burns you out as a creator. They say, just be more consistent or, you know, just make a great show and ask your guests to rate and review or ask your audience to rate and review and they'll share it and word of mouth and all this stuff. And, and none of that stuff actually works. Ask your guests, ask your guests to share on social media. They don't, they don't share. Like they're just not going to do it. You know what I mean? <laughs> so all these things and I'm like, holy crap. It turns out that none of this stuff is working and it's not me. It's not my podcast. It's actually just these tactics that I got from well-meaning people on the internet who pretty much are just sharing advice that they've gotten elsewhere, but who haven't actually grown shows. So, you know, getting back to, uh, to what kind of what happened, the, what I would recommend that you do, I'll get to that in a second. But basically, once I figured this out and, and learned that what the internet teaches us on how to grow podcasts is wrong and that there's better ways to do it, not that I have the secrets, but it's actually pretty intuitive but either way, if you just change up the way you're doing it, that's when within a year of that, I was able to take that show, a, lo a local show, a niche show, pass $100,000 and downloads and have since done it with that's other amazing. shows and stuff like that. Thank you. And, and I'm very grateful to have done that, but it's actually pretty intuitive and it's not, it's not all that, it's not as hard. It's actually easier to do than what most people are doing to grow their podcast. I found that I spent less time on social media than I was before for my podcast and it was growing faster. And now with the people that I help through the Grow the Show podcast, through my accelerator program, but you do not have to be in my program to get this to work. Um, it, we do something called targeted daily engagement, spend 15 really targeted minutes on social media every single day, just 15 minutes. And people see their audience grow 60, hundred percent per month, just from these targeted 15 minutes of engagement. And so wow. it, it's, it, and it's great. And like, that's what I do now. Like, that's it. Like, you know, I have the Grow the Show podcast. I still do my show, Philly Who. And now I'm a podcast coach and, and I help other people do this. So getting back to your actual question, what do I recommend <laughs> people do? Mm -hmm. First of all, uh, make sure that you have something that people are willing to pay money for before you get the job. I was so, or before you leave the job, 
I was so hell bent on not having the corporate job, not having a boss, those sort of things um, that, but I didn't understand business. I didn't understand uh, product market fit or podcast market fit, or like, you know, understanding, you know, that sponsors for my podcast are not just going to pay me to make my podcast. They're going to pay me if they think that they're going to get a return on that investment and get customers for my pod. Just business fundamentals like that. I didn't have because my, back, my background was in software. So long story short, like what I would recommend anybody do before leaving the job is to, you know, the thing that you want to leave your job to do, it's got to be making money, at least making money. It doesn't necessarily have to be replacing your income yet, um, but it should be making money to the point where uh, it, it starts to like, you can grow at nights and weekends. And then there, there will come a threshold where it can't grow anymore because it needs your full attention. And I think that's the moment to take the leap. Um, and I'd be curious if you agree with that, cause that's what this whole show is about. Um, yeah. but, but, you know, having done it the wrong way, I got lucky. I, my back was to the wall and like things got ugly and I went into some debt. So I would not recommend it that way. Not thankfully, not, not that that's not the case anymore, but either way, like I got, I got lucky and, you know, I kind of just said, I'm doing this. And I don't think that was the best way to do it. <laughs> um, so Kevin, so I, I actually totally, I totally agree with you that yeah. uh, what you just described is exactly what I recommend to people. Yeah. Um, I think the biggest challenge most people have is they actually have hit that point where um, they have, uh, they have enough clients, they have enough money coming in that they yeah. really could quit. Yeah. Um, and go ahead and replace their income uh, within 30 to 90 days. Wow. And they don't have any more time to take on any more clients or build their income anymore, but yeah. yet they're too afraid to, to let go of the corporate world. And then yeah. that's when they get in a kind of an ugly spiral downwards. Right. Because and that, so that thing that they've built needs their full attention or it needs the oxygen that your corporate job yes. is taking from it. That's right. So that's the point. And, and, you know, yeah, if I did it again, I'd do it that way. <laughs> I was on the other <laughs> side where I was just too ready to, you know, too, too reckless with it. Um, so I think that there's a happy medium that, that of course it's really, really easier said than done, but, but yeah. It is easier said than done because I did the same thing you did. I just was done. I was like, I'm right. so done with this. And I did it back in 1996. And I will tell you that, that, uh uh, blowback that you expected. I got big time. Back yeah. Then. Everybody at my corporate job, all my, everyone except my husband, thank you, God said, yeah. you're making the biggest mistake. You should never quit. I was 40 at the time. Wow. Nobody else is going to hire somebody at 40. Right. Wow. Um, yeah. yeah. And I so, quit and, and I, I'll <laughs> without say anything I was, to go to. Right. Right. <laughs> I, I was coming from technology and this was in 20. 18, where, you know, after 15 years of tech startup Zuckerberg, you know what I mean? So people are like, oh, cool. You're going to be the next that guy, which I didn't right. want to be, but, but that's why I think people are down. And also I know for a fact now that the people in my life who felt the way those people felt where they were like, what are you doing? You're losing it. Just didn't tell me because <laughs> I later, <laughs> once I figured it out and it was working, I asked, I was like, Hey, what'd you, what'd you think when I did that? And they were like, we thought, I thought that was the dumbest thing I've ever seen in my life. How is he throwing this away? Like <laughs> to do, to do podcasting, whatever. And I'm like, wow, uh, thanks for not saying that. <laughs> so yeah. I, like yeah. I said, really lucky to have. And I actually, support. I actually look at you and, um, uh, people who are able to do it at an earlier stage, like you have been able to do it. Um, I admire you, um, uh, greatly because I really spent at least a decade too long. I was at my sure. corporate job almost 20 years. Imagine yeah. being there for 20 years, not just yeah. four, but wow. 20. And the last decade, you didn't want to be there. I can't I can imagine that, you know, having not <laughs> having been somewhere where I don't want to be, but I, I can't imagine doing it that yeah. long. But I understand yeah. why I understand why he did though. Like, yeah, because the world in particular, like I think um, I mean, you could tell me, but I feel like entrepreneurship is a little bit more in vogue now. Is, is that the case than it was? Back oh, yeah. Then? yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, because back then it really was, you know, like now they say, oh, you want the secure job. I'm sorry. Corporations are no longer secure. If right. you think they are, you need to really examine no the facts and figures. Right. But back then they really were still pretty secure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, people weren't being let go quite as quickly. But um, I just decided that I could, I, I thought, okay, everybody was like, you only have 15 years left till you can retire. And to me, I thought 
15 years. That that's my life. That is my life. I'm talking about. Yeah. What could I do with 15 years instead of this? Yeah. If I don't make it, I don't make it yeah. and I'll figure out something else. Right. Just like you did. Your back was against the wall. You figured it out. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And yeah, I truly exactly. believe we can all figure it out. We really it's, can. It's those moments of discomfort where you have no other choice, but to figure it out where you make the biggest strides, where you, you know, where you make a name for yourself, right. Where you achieve the greatest thing yeah. because you had no other option. <laughs> That's exactly right. Yeah. But again, yeah. so I thing. admire you greatly and I'm so excited uh, to be able to thank you for sharing that story. That was awesome. Yeah, and I love welcome. that, you know, you're a little unsure and everybody said yes, but then uh, it's just a great story. Thank you. So grow the show. Um, you, you still have Philly who, and now you have yeah. grow the show. How long's grow the show been around? Yeah. So the, Excel, it's funny. I started the program say, say again. Um, no, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, sure. So Philly Who started in 2018. And for a while, once I figured it out, I did Philly Who just, that was that. I, I just did that for a little while, maybe a little under a year where that was my main source of income. And it's kind of all I did. And then I started um, consulting for bigger media companies to help them grow their show, like Comcast, NBC, and like iHeartRadio. And, um, and then in 2020, so I had, I eventually had an agency actually that did podcast production and consulting for bigger media companies as oh. podcasting got bigger. And so that was pretty much 2019, 2018, first half of 2019 was just Philly who then for a few months, you know, like eight months, I did the consulting and, and production work and had a team and a studio space and everything. And then when COVID hit, um, all but one of our projects went away, understandably. Um, uh, and so I kind of was back just got vaulted backwards where I just had the one, I was kind of like freelancing plus again, after having a team and having all this stuff, which I, I wasn't too mad about actually, because I didn't actually enjoy the production work as much. Cause I found that I was mm. still working for someone else and getting paid less and working harder hours. <laughs> you know what I mean? I was like, this is the same thing that I tried to escape. So, you know, when COVID happened and a lot of the projects went away, they were great projects, great people, but I wasn't all that mad. And I had some extra time and for a couple of months just was like, okay, who else can I help here? Like, how, how can I help in the podcast world? And so I actually set up conversations with 30 podcasters within my network and just said, Hey, what do you need help with? Like, what are you, what are your goals? What are you trying to do all 30 for 30? No exceptions. Everyone said, how do I get more listeners for my show? How do I monetize this thing? I would love to turn it to a business. And I was like, wow, I actually know how to do those things. And so I started just kind of one-on-one -on -one helping a few independent podcasters and it start, started seeing immediate results. And I was like, wow, this is really fun. I think I can make a way bigger impact on the world if I did this instead of just helped NBC. <laughs> you know what I mean? NBC can find somebody else to do that. Well, again, I love them, but still. Um, and, and then in July of 2020, I uh, launched the Grow the Show Podcast Accelerator Program and started helping independent podcasters through this course and coaching. And we do editing as well for, for those who join the program for a couple months. And then in October of 2020, launched the Grow the Show podcast, which is essentially the same material that I teach, but just totally free and in podcast form instead of um, a course. And so pretty much since July 2020, my I put actually put Philly Who on hiatus um, for a while. One reason, because a lot of the Philly leaders that I usually interview were busy leading their organizations through the COVID crisis. And so it was just harder to schedule interviews. Um, and also it had been two and a half years and I was ready for a break from the show. So we put the show on hiatus. We're actually bringing it back on May 4th of this year. Very excited for that. Um, Congratulations. So, Exciting. Very, very excited to have it back. I miss it now, which is, which is cool. And so for t literally since July, uh, June, 2020 until I guess May 4th or whatever, I've just been literally full time, pretty much every waking hour. Cause there's nothing else to do because of the quarantine uh, helping independent podcasters grow and monetize and learn how to actually grow their audience. That is fabulous. And so how did, um, first of all, how did COVID impact you and you personally and your business? Yeah. So at that point it was the agency. We had three really cool pilots with like big name companies that we had developed and, and, you know, they're like really heavily produced show, like think, think like NPR level type production stuff, really like, like journalistic documentary style stuff, really cool. and had a blast making it. But again, was working really, really hard. The pay was lower <laughs> than the software gig. Um, but we were on, we were on a great path, but what happened, but as soon as COVID happened, my clients were big media companies. And like, for instance, one of them is, was had a huge partnership with 
this company Viacom, Showtime, which is owned by Viacom, and Viacom lost a billion dollars when they canceled the NCAA basketball tournament. So that like trickled all the way down and they said, hey, we can't do this project anymore. And so that happened across pretty much all of our projects. And uh, I found myself in a position where pretty much all the work had evaporated overnight. So of course, like everyone else, I was terrified of the impending pandemic and what would this mean? And would I lose any loved ones? And I did wind up losing a few, but you know, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. Uh, I appreciate that. I mean, <laughs> it's been a tough year for everyone. Right. Um, however, really, truly, like I, I tried to look at the situation. How could this be a gift? You know, cause that's all you can do <laughs> right in, in tough situations. Yes. How can this be a gift? I love that. And mm -hmm. that's what I like literally throughout April when it was the scariest for most of us, I think, because that was when it was really yes. blowing up and we're like, how long is this going to be? And right. And like, how serious is, what if I get it? Like, am I going to die? And we, I mean, even 20, 29 years old or like 28 at the time, like oh, this could be it. Cause we didn't know, like this could, this thing could wipe out all of us. Right. right? So the whole time I'm thinking, how this could be a gift? How can this be a gift? How can this be a gift? And so at first it was just some time because I had been doing the, the burnout entrepreneur thing for two and a half years. So I really leaned into having some time to breathe because financially I was all right. Thankfully the Comcast NBC gig and um, my podcast, I was fine. I, and, and I figured out like if every, if I didn't get any new work for six months, I'd be okay. And so that was a very privileged place to be in. And so I had the ability to kind of relax for a little while and just like sleep till nine each day, <laughs> you know, and just kind of. <laughs> hang out. And so despite the fact that it wasn't truly relaxing, because the time was so fearsome, right. um, still was just, that was the repetition. How could this be a gift? How could, how could this be a gift? And so I started looking for that and looking for, okay, how can, this is an opportunity to start something new to help somebody else. Like, you know, I didn't, I, I was already looking at the work I was doing, the production work, the agency's work, and knowing that I, I didn't want to sign up to do this for five to 10 years. And at this rate, I really don't know what the payoff would be because I'm not making tons of money and, you know, I would like to, you know, build wealth. So I just was like, okay, maybe it's a good thing that that got taken away from me. And then just through, I mean, it, it's funny because it feels like a blip now, but it really was two or three months of what am I going to do? Like, just stay calm. This is okay. Like I can stay home. I'm safe. I'm healthy, all that type of stuff. And then it just came from, okay, who do I want to help? It went from how can this be a gift? How can this be a gift to who do I, who do I want to help? Who do I want to help? And that's the advice that I give anybody who wants to start a business. Um, after many tries, many tries of saying, what do I want to make? And that not working. I was like, okay, who do I want yeah. to help? And that's what led me to those conversations. A mentor of mine said, just talk to 30 podcasters. Uh, if you want to be in the podcast world and see what they need help with. And it was just crazy that it was just the loudest chorus I've ever heard. Like I need these things. I need these things. And I was like, wow, I can actually help with that. And so, you know, all things considered health and safety, you know, there's obviously, it's obviously been a gruesome year in a lot of ways, but, you know, I'm grateful <laughs> because through mm -hmm. it was born grow the show, which is just growing at a rate that I couldn't even have, have imagined. And yeah, I mean, wow. I'm, I'm here because of that. You know what I mean? So it's, yeah, it's I love crazy. it. It's, it's been a crazy year. And, and like I said, all things considered, um, I'm pretty grateful for lending where I have. So Kevin, how do you have such a positive attitude? Because your whole attitude of um, how, you know, how do I turn this into a positive? How do I make this a good thing? What's the silver lining? I love your mantra on that. Thank you. Um, is that just something that you, that is just natural for you? Did you learn that? A little bit of both. Um, I, I learned it after after college, I, I really got into like personal development stuff. And actually that particular, it's funny because a friend of mine, Samuel Zeff, uh, who I met randomly at a, a networking event, we got beers a couple times. And the second time he said, <laughs> he said, Hey, I've got this extra ticket to this event in Florida. It's this Tony Robbins thing. And I was like, Tony Robbins. Oh my God, that guy, that influential <laughs> guy, right? <laughs> really? And he's like, well, yeah. hey, man, it's like a VIP ticket. So it's yours if you want it. And I'm Ooh. like, why are you giving it to yeah. me? Like, we don't even know each other. <laughs> Mm -hmm. But he, it was gifted to him by somebody else who didn't need it. And so he just uh, had an extra one. And so, and he's just like, I just feel like, you know, you'd really appreciate this more than anyone else. And I was like, oh, okay, man. And what's funny is that that was in November of 2019. And uh, the week of, I was so stressed out with all my client work that I almost canceled. I almost didn't go. Um, but I did. I had already booked the flight and I was like, what am I going to do? Leave the, let this guy go to Miami by himself. So I went and um, there were a few, like it, it was, it, it's like a 
oil change for your brain in a lot of ways. Like I've always had a positive attitude, but it's just, re- especially in entrepreneurship that you get beat down a lot and it's easy to internalize that. And so I, and I was, because I was so new to it. And I didn't understand, you know, I thought it was me. And so I was internalizing that. And I went to this event, Unleash the Power Within. And, you know, I'd, I've taken and, and um, consumed other personal development stuff, but this one just came at the right time, at the absolute right time. And that's so important, you know, for something to resonate. And that was one of the things that, that stuck out that I remembered. How can this be a gift that, you know, Tony Robbins or one of the people that he had speak said, and, and it was only six months before COVID happened. Um, and so that, that's why, you know, it had just happened. So I was lucky enough <laughs> to have just received that message. Um, mm-hmm. And since then, like it served me so well, like what, what I'm like, I've learned. It's just, that was the seed, I think, where I was able to trust the ability to look on the bright side because the world kind of teaches you to look on the dark side of everything. And I had internalized that. And then after having this experience where it was, a, we, we all experienced probably one of the darkest periods many of us ever have experienced over the past year. Right. The fact that looking on the bright side and looking for the gift and, and you get what you focus on, um, mm-hmm. that type of thing. I tried to focus on what was good and that has served me so well in the past year that like now I'm just like, <laughs> you know, that's all there is to do, right? You know what I mean? Like it's worked so well that I'm like, man, why, why would anybody else do anything? Now I know, of course, there are peaks and valleys in life and I'm sure I'll need another mental oil change in another year or two. But, um, but yeah, that's, it's just, that was the other thing that stuck with me. You get what you focus on. Every situation has light and dark, yin and yang. And, you know, a lot of, we, we are taught to ask, why is this happening to me? Um, and like, and taught to look at everything that's wrong, particularly as consumers. Um, but there's always an equal amount of good in every scenario, every single one. Um, and so it's just a matter of which one we focus on. That's what we get. I don't know. Now I'm getting all philosophical on you, but (laughs) no, I love that, that I absolutely love that. Um, and I just think that is so crucial because as an entrepreneur, if you don't have that attitude, right, you're not going to make it. Because as you say, I, I feel like it's a roller coaster ride and yeah. I've decided to have fun on this roller coaster ride exactly. yeah. <laughs> rather than be scared. Right, right. And, and, and I'm going to be courageous. I, I'm not going to back down from the fear. I'm going to be courageous. I'm going to enjoy the ride. And I know it is a ride. Yeah, exactly. And in those in those dips, the parts where, you know, you're in the loop and you're like, oh, I might lose it. You know what I mean? That you're just like, <laughs> you know what? The loop isn't going to go forever. And pretty soon it's going to be great. And then in the moments where it's great, you're, you're like, all right, there's going to be a loop soon. So I'm going to like, just kind of save it. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's a part of the journey. And with that kind of perspective, yeah. it just makes the, it makes the be- the great times better and the bad times also better. Yeah, it does. Yeah. I love that. that is, I, I love your philosophy. All right. So let's shift topics sure. and please share with us. Um, I, well, I, I want to do two different topics. First, let, sure. I want to ask you, what do you think? Since you're so involved in podcasts, I'd love that. And I'd love to hear any predictions. Where do you think this podcast industry is going? Because, I mean, as we all know, it has grown exponentially with COVID. And I'm personally thrilled that it has, not because I have a podcast, but because I love podcasts. I love consuming them. Yeah. So where do you think it's headed? So it's an interesting place because it's still very early. It's very nascent. There, you know, they say that there's a 1.7 million podcasts on iTunes, but there's actually only about 300,000 that are active um, that have released in the past six mm. months. Mm. Compare that to, all right, so we'll say, but we'll say 1.7 million, 1.7 million podcasts. There are 30 million blogs and there are, sorry, mm. there are 30 million YouTube channels, 30 million, mm. and there are 500 million blogs, 500 million. So, mm. It's funny to me when people say, don't you think it's a little late to get into podcasting? <laughs> and I'm like, well, nobody says that about YouTube channels. And there's literally what, do the math, 15x the amount. So it's funny in that way. Um, so that is early. funny. I'm so glad you shared those stats because I didn't know that. And I would have been one of them that said, God, there's just so many podcasts. Right, right. And the other thing is um, there, Buzzsprout and Libsyn, two of the biggest podcast hosts, release uh, what they get. They, they have a lot of data around how many downloads each podcast gets. And I wish I had the numbers in front of me. Um, I can give you the link afterwards if you want to put it in the show notes or whatever. But OK, um, yeah, let's do that. There, if you, it's something like, gosh, I hope I don't bungle the, the numbers too much, but it's something That's like okay. if you have over a thousand downloads per episode, you are in like the top five to 1% of all podcasts in the world. 
And if you have over, that. over like 150 or in the top 50% or something like that. So I believe you know, it. it. Right. And so it's like, if you, and like a lot of <laughs> podcasters who have like 300 downloads per episode think that's nothing, but that's like top 80%, <laughs> which is like, you know, it's significant. <laughs> So yeah. on one hand, I think, you know, the podcast industry is, is here to stay. It's the only medium that, you know, in a world that's, how can we get shorter? How can we get shorter? How can we get this 10 second video to six seconds? It's the only place where the consumer is willing to give you 30 minutes of time just as a test 30 minutes. It's insane. Wow. That is insane. Um, and if, you know, if, so, if someone binges a podcast episode to check it out, binges five episodes, that's like, you know, what, between two and a half and five hours that they're spending with you. And there's mm-hmm. literally no other medium where you get that amount of time and nuance and attention with a guest or with a listener. Um, and so for that reason, I don't think it's going anywhere and it's totally unique. Um, so that plus the, the nascency of the industry and the fact that they're really, it really isn't it isn't saturated at all. There's only 300,000 active podcasts in the world on Apple podcasts. Having said that part of the, so nothing but opportunity, but the problem that I see and the reason why so many 1.4 million podcasts on Apple podcasts are dead is because people don't know how to grow their audience because the internet is teaching people that you, you grow your audience by being consistent, by relying on your, by relying on word of mouth and relying on your guests to share and on posting on social media. And none of those things actually bring you new podcast listeners in a reliable way, in a way that gives you healthy growth. Um, and so with all the potential that the podcasting industry has, if there isn't change in the way that we approach growing our audience and, and actually turning the show into a business, right? The, the show, the thing's going to have to pay for itself. So pretty much every podcast that wants to be, that wants to last needs to be monetized. It can't just go off of the creator's sheer passion alone. They will burn out after six months. I did. And that's why most podcasts go away. And so yeah. give, there's so much potential in the industry, but it's undoing will be the way that we think about it. And the, the just vast amount of limiting, limiting beliefs that are so pervasive right now in the podcast industry. So I really don't know where it's going to go. What I would like to do is to help as many independent podcasters figure this stuff out and turn their show into a business or at least have it pay for itself as possible so that this industry can actually fulfill its potential. Yeah. Oh, I love that. So one of the things you said earlier on, I want to re-explore and it is um, you want to change the world. So tell me more about how you want to change the world. Yeah. It's, it's through what I'm talking about right now. Like this is an impact that I think that I can literally have quite quickly. You know, there are, you know, in just what six months since the show launched the, the podcast launched, you know, we've reached several thousand podcasters. So it's already in the top 1%. Right. Um, and the results that we see people like start just changing the way they approach their social media and they're seeing literally 100% growth. I had somebody reach out recently who said I was averaging 100 downloads per episode, and now I average 1,000 after like a couple of weeks, which I was like, that's, but he showed me <laughs> the screenshots, and I was like, well, that's nuts. Uh, and he's not even in my program. He just like listened to a couple episodes of the show and was like, here's the results. And, and I see that all the time. And then the focus, we've got 50 podcasters in the accelerator program and across the board, they're, they're monetizing, they're getting advertisement deals. They're growing their audience on average 25% per month. And so with that, with like just a little time that I've had in the space, I'm like, holy crap, this is, this is incredible impact. And, you know, like, like I said, I'm the luckiest person in the world to be able to see that impact so quickly. And so that's where I think I can change this because there is no middle class in podcasting right now. There are a handful of shows that make millions of dollars and then everyone else is at the bottom with Makes very nothing. few listeners making very little money, if at all. Yes. And yeah. there's no Everybody reason. Everybody thinks they can be the next Joe Rogan. Every, right. And everyone thinks that, <laughs> and everyone thinks that that's the only way to do it, right? That you have to have a million downloads and sell ads to Casper mattresses at $25 per every thousand downloads. And that's the only way. And so they think, oh, well, I can't monetize my podcast until I reach 10,000 downloads. When the reality is you can't reach 10,000 downloads unless you monetize your podcast. And so oh. that's the impact that I'm looking to have. It's like, you don't need to quit your job to do this but we do need to make it so that the show supports itself because it's just not going to be able to ride off of your passion alone, even full time. As somebody who spent 60 hours on a podcast with no other job, it still wasn't enough. So 
that's mm-hmm. the impact that I think I can have. And particularly in, in the culture that we have in the U S and, and, and in Western culture now, cause several of the podcasters that I help are, you know, in Australia and in Europe and stuff like that, like we want to be able to make a living being a creative entrepreneur and people can do it easily on YouTube right now, fairly easily. People can do it on Instagram and on TikTok because they have platforms built in that will just, you make it, they bring you the audience. And then some of them like YouTube just pay you. And it's just bada bang. It's just turnkey podcasting. That's not the case. You have to do it yourself, but you can do it yourself. That's the thing. And you get to own more. You own your audience. You make more of the money instead of a little sliver of the YouTube ads. And so it can be a really, really fulfilling and lucrative thing. It's just that the mindset isn't there for most of the world. And so I really think that I can help change many lives and help people who want to at least make money at most make a living off of a podcast. It's totally possible. And that's the impact that I would like to have. I love your passion so much, Kevin. <laughs> I, I love it. I love it. Thanks, Kevin. Okay. So now to the next topic, which is yeah. what tips can you share with us in the limited amount of time we have left? Sure. And can you tell Kevin that I like, I like long podcasts. I love it. Oh, me too. I'm here for it. <laughs> so because kind of you're like looking? 30 minutes and I'm like, I've never wrapped one up in 30 minutes ever right, right, right. that I've done. <laughs> right. No, I'm, I'm all for it. I love it too. It's you got it. And, and again, like we were able to go in the new nuance of how I was able to tell you that a lot of my outlook comes from singing with a bunch of old people. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I like, love would it. Never talk, and like I say that in, in nothing but endearing because they have been like the folks that I sing with have provided such perspective in my life and I'm incredibly grateful for that, but we never would have talked about that if we had to wrap this up in 15 minutes, you know, if we had to just do the whole thing in 15 right. minutes and, and this, yeah. that piece of the conversation would never have made it onto a YouTube video or onto a TikTok or onto an Instagram, you know what I mean? And so that's why absolutely this, this is the medium. Um, I will say that I have learned, I probably learned more from podcasts now than I learned from anywhere else. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I love it. I love the format. And, and I, n- I not only like to have a longer format for mine, cause I like to dig deep. Um, but I like the long ones when I listen, I don't like two and a half hours necessarily yeah. when it, you know, on a topic I'm not really interested in, but I'm gonna right. tell you right now, if it's a topic I'm interested in, I'll listen for two and a half hours. Sure, yeah, yeah. And I am yeah. a binger Ooh. Yeah. and I get depressed. It's like r- finishing a book. I get right. depressed when, you run out. when I'm done binging a podcast and I'm like, no, I have to wait for every week to get one <laughs> right 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 because you're caught up and the thing is there isn't as much supply of great shows as we think and so it's kind of hard to find one that's binge worthy right now so you're kind of left you're like absolutely when you... right because i've been looking right i've been looking and now i'm gonna go get yours um oh, oh, and and i feel like i've just found a little gold mine when i find a new one that i want because right. i'll get on the browse and i i know that there are a lot that aren't any longer simply because i'm out there browsing and i yeah. pull it up and it hasn't had a new episode for a right. year or two and i'm like like well i'm not gonna look at that one you know but a lot of them are incredible shows and the creators got burned out because through no fault yeah. of their own they didn't yeah. know how to reliably grow their audience and probably had some living, like wasn't able to monetize or whatever. You know what I mean? Like, right. Um, right. or they wanted to like, you know, some people just don't want to do it anymore, which is cool. But there are also tons of shows that went away because this stuff was never figured out. And unfortunately the internet wasn't able to support. Um, so. All right. So tips, what yeah. tips can you give us in like five to 10 minutes sure. for, for what? <laughs> um, for- or even teasers on how to grow your number of podcast listeners. Yeah, absolutely. So no teasers, nothing but whole kit and caboodle. I'm a big fan of just giving away. The okay, cool. So give it away, baby. Here we go. <laughs> Sorry, Targeted. I just called you baby. I didn't <laughs> no, mean to be uh, sexually harassing you. <laughs> no, no, I said old people. <laughs> I'm kidding. So like, I'm like, oh, I shouldn't have said that. Um, but targeted daily engagement. That is what we do at Grow the Show. And what that means is you pick, you schedule 15, minimum 15 minutes a day, maximum 60 minutes a day on your calendar to engage on social media. A couple of prerequisites to this. Number one, you have to have a really specific idea of the listener that you're trying to reach. If you just say entrepreneurs, it's not going to be specific enough. It's not going to work. The, the rule of thumb there is blanks who blank and blank people who satisfy that criteria. Those are the people that we're targeting. Not nece- Now your content will work for people outside of that target, but just to target, we got to start with this group of people. So have that target audience. Number two prerequisite 
is make it so that your social media profile of choice, Instagram, Facebook, whichever one you're engaging on, drives people to your podcast, has very little friction from the moment they click on your profile for the first time and the moment they are like, oh, wow, this podcast looks great. So if you're on Facebook, the cover photo should have something about your show and why it's awesome. Your link in bio should just just be a link to the podcast, not the founder of this and the this, that, and the this funnel and the that, just one link. Because if there's a million links, nobody's going to click any of them. Um, right. And so that's number two, very low friction on your profile. And then number three, and this is the part that people don't like, but it's also incredibly freeing on your social, whichever one you're on your profile or your, you know, the platform unfollow everyone that doesn't give you massive, massive value when you see their posts, everyone. And I'm talking like brands. I'm talking the restaurant down the street. I'm talking that person that you went to high school with and you see pictures of their kids three times a week, but you didn't even talk to them when you were in high school together, all gone. If you're nervous that people are going to see that you unfollowed them and be offended, you can mute them. But anyone where when you see their post, you don't go, oh, like you don't have a visceral positive reaction, gone. So that's prerequisite number three. And like I said, it's actually incredibly free. Could you say that. why on that number three one? Why? Yes. Why? Because when we do the targeted daily engagement, the goal is to get in there and engage with our future audiences. Facebook, Instagram, TikTok are designed to keep you in and to pull you in, right? How many times have you gone on Facebook just because you had five minutes and then suddenly 30 minutes goes by? They're designed by people with multiple PhDs in psychology and human behavior, whose literal job is to make you stick on that app. So with this targeted daily engagement, we need to get that stuff out of our way so that we can make social media work for us instead of us working for social media. Because otherwise what's gonna happen is you're gonna hop in to do your 15 minutes of targeted daily engagement, which I'll tell you in just a second exactly how to do that but you're going to get pulled away by the pictures of the kids of someone from high school or by, you know, the political post by your uncle that Mm. just gets you going and you got to comment on it. And then boom, you're gone. You're lost. So all that stuff. I get it now. I get it. Okay. And you're going to find that your life is much more peaceful actually once you do this. Um, And you have something to talk about when you do find to see those people later. So those are the prerequisites. (laughs) We haven't even started yet. Then what we do, we put it on our calendar, 15 minimum, 15 minutes minimum. It's on your calendar. If someone tries to schedule you, I'm sorry, I'm busy. I have a commitment during those 15 minutes. This is all you do. You don't have the TV on just this maximum 60 minutes. Once you start doing this and you start seeing immediate results, you're going to get more followers. You're going to get more downloads. You're going to start to collaborate with people, right? You're going to make connections with people that you thought you could maybe invite on your podcast someday. You're going to actually be able to interact with them right now and have them on your show next week. That's going to be exciting. So you're going to want to do more of this, but you have to cap it at 60 minutes because then you'll be pulled into social media and you're going to start wasting time, time that you should be spending doing other things. Those are all the prerequisites. Sounds complicated, but it's not. Targeted daily No, engagement. it doesn't so far. It really doesn't. Cool. Great. And that's the thing. Like, yeah. When I'm done with this, you're going to be like, that's it. But I'm telling you, that's it. You start doing this talk again in a week. You're going to have 50 more Instagram followers and you're going to start to see your downloads go up even if you don't release. So targeted deal engagement prerequisites are done. Now, what do we do? We go online and we engage in four different ways. You don't have to do all four in a given day, but you do have to do them at least once a week at best twice a week. Okay. Number okay. one is you go to what we call the watering holes. That really specific idea of your listener, the blanks who blank and blank, where mm-hmm. do they go online to interact with each other? Facebook groups, clubhouse rooms, subreddits, forums, the comments of influencers, all these places where your target listener currently goes to interact with each other. We go there, but we don't promote. We participate. That's it. Remember, we have already set up our social media profile so that when they say, oh my gosh, who is this Kathy person? What an incredibly valuable comment. Let me click on her profile. Oh my gosh, the Dare to Leap podcast. That sounds interesting. Boom. You have a listener. Instead, what most people do is they join a Facebook group and the first thing that they do after they have checked a box that says, I will not be self-promoting and I agree not to promote myself. What do they do? Promote. Hey, everyone, check out my podcast. This week's episode. Nope, nope, nope. And then you at best get completely ignored and at worst get booted from the group. That's not what works. Right. Don't promote, Mm -hmm. participate, answer questions, share your opinion, uh, celebrate other people's wins. That's it. Okay. So that's number one in the watering holes. And I, I have a, a client, Anna Dearman Cornick, who did just watering holes for 15 minutes a day in one month. Her audience grew 
And she got invited on four podcasts just from watering holes. Number two. Awesome. You can do this on hashtags as well on Instagram. So the, the your target listener, the blanks who blank and blank are identifying themselves on hashtags. So this is the Gary V, whether or not you like his content, it's a great strategy, the dollar 80 strategy. He says you should leave your two cents on 90 posts every day to grow your account. I think 90 is a little extreme. I say do 10. Go on Instagram, search, find hashtags where your future, your target listeners are ident- identifying themselves. Leave your two cents on their posts. Go to the recent posts, not the top posts because those are old. Recent post, find a good one, find one that resonates with you and leave a thoughtful comment, not emojis, not nice, something thoughtful. Better not to leave a comment than to leave something non-thoughtful. People are going to come to your account in droves. And remember, you've set up your Instagram so that the link goes to your podcast, right? So that's how, and how much, am I good on time? I got two more pieces. <laughs> you're good. Okay. You're If you're good, I'm good. I'm good. All right, cool. So that's piece one is the watering holes where your current, where your future listeners interact with each other. You go participate, don't promote. Number two, same thing on hashtags, on the comments of your future listeners' posts, something thoughtful. Stage three, step three, we engage with our dream collaborators. So Russell Brunson has a concept called the Dream 100. Actually, that's not his concept, but he has popularized it recently. Um, Same deal. I'm, I'm familiar with Dream 100. Yeah, so we pick 50 to 100 dream collaborators. If you're an interview show, it's dream guests. Uh, dr- founders of the companies that would be a dream sponsor, uh, thought leaders, influencers, right? In Within our targeted daily engagement window, we engage. We comment thoughtfully on their posts. A lot of people think that those people who are a couple chapters ahead have millions you know, of followers or whatever, they think that they're not on social media, but they are. It's those people. They don't have some team running their account. It's them. And so if you just engage on their posts, they, they post something, comment something thoughtfully, they're going to respond. And what's going to happen is you are going to start to develop a relationship because when the time comes for you to pitch them to collaborate with you, to be on your show, they will recognize your name as somebody they have interacted before and a valuable member of their community, excuse me, who has already contributed to their community. What most people do is they say, I want to have Will Smith on my Philly podcast. And they dream up, okay, in three years, when I have a million downloads, I'm going to write the perfect cold pitch email to Will Smith's assistant. And that's going to get him, right? No. (laughs) What will, now I admittedly haven't had Will Smith yet, but what does work is actually engaging with that person. And then a week later, actually, like what's going to happen is you're going to comment and you're going to start to have a conversation. This is one thing where like, if you're, you know, you could go do this spend 10 minutes doing this tonight. And I guarantee, I guarantee you'll get three responses from celebrities or dream collaborators that you never would have thought that you could connect with right now. And you don't ask them for anything. Don't tell them your life story. Don't tell them I'm such a big fan. Like they get that all the time. Just participate like they're a friend and you can even DM them stuff and they will participate. And then when the time comes, whenever you're ready, they will DM with you. Absolutely. If, if you're not asking wow. them for something, because right. everyone asks them is like, for anything. right. Will you be on my podcast? I love your book. Can you give me this advice? Like that's what they get all the time. But if you're just like, Hey, I really like, I really love what you said about this. I think that's really interesting. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. They're like, Oh my gosh, that's so great. Yeah. Blah, 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 blah. Now you're friends, you're friends with that person. So not only are you starting to build relationships with these dream collaborators and you can pitch them. So I have one client, Ina Coveney, who launched a show from scratch after learning this for episode one was John Lee Dumas. Episode two was Pat Flynn. She's only had dream guests on her podcast since then. She's turned down so many people. And now she actually has, and I have screenshots. I can show you if you want. She has her dream guests pitching her because now the word is starting to spread in their networks, right? That you got to be on this podcast. Oh, I and love that from her, so much. It's just from her engaging with them and being a peer, right? What's also cool is then you can also engage with the people in the comments, right? So you comment, like, let's say it's Pat Flynn's post or whatever, Will Smith's, you comment and you strike up a conversation with them. They're not always going to answer and that's okay. But most of the time they will. And after two or three times, they know who you are rather than just some random person who goes into an email inbox that gets read by somebody who they hired in order to deflect you. Like someone's job is to deflect you. So let's not go there. Let's go straight to the person. So and I'm going way over time here, but I'm getting all jacked up. No, no, so, you're good, Kevin. You're okay, cool. good. If you have time, <laughs> seriously, I'm not in a rush at all. Okay, cool. I cool, love cool. this. So that's number three. And in the comments, by the way, of that post are people who are in your target audience, right? 
And so you can interact with them there and they're going to click on your show and they're going to check out your podcast. And then the fourth piece is with journalists. And I don't just mean traditional journalists. Yes, reporters, editors, producers, but your journalists, right? Right here, what we're doing now, you're interviewing me. So other podcasters, mm -hmm. bloggers, those who write newsletters, people who have access to your future listeners in droves, right? Who have already assembled your future audience. Once again, we just engage with them on social media. And the way to do that with them is to simply share their work with a thoughtful comment. This is for reporters. This is best done on Twitter, but for other types of creators, it's wherever, you know, they have their main presence. And so just fo start following their work. And if it's a great podcast episode, share a link to their, help them spread the word on their work. They all are people with work-life balance issues who are trying to meet deadline. So just help them share their work. I have one client, Eric Schlein. And again, I keep mentioning clients, but you don't have to join my program. This is all, this is all going to work for you. Um, I love my one this. Client, Eric Schlein, he has a, he has the intelligent investing podcast and he started doing TDE with this one, his favorite, uh, investing reporter for business insider. And so he just would share great article by so-and-so here's my two cents. You know, I, I, I like this part and the key, particularly on Twitter is to tag the creator, not the outlet. So don't tag business insider there. That intern is not going to give a crap tag the actual author's personal account. And so he did that a couple of times. And then later that uh, about a week later, that journalist, his name is escaping me. His last name is Muhammad. I can't remember his first name posted something about Warren Buffett. Eric in the replies said, Hey, actually they went public with Verizon in 29 or something, you know, some investor speak thing. And, and the reporter said, Oh, great. Wow. I didn't know that. Thank you. So Eric contributed asking nothing in return. He helped the journalist. What do you think happened five minutes later? He got a DM. Journalist contacted him. A DM on Twitter. It said, hey, Eric, would you mind sharing your thoughts on the, on the Buffett move for Business Insider? Ooh. A week later in Business Insider, there's a dedicated article. Eric Schlein, investor shares, blah, you know, his take on Verizon and whatever it was. And in it says, Eric Schlein, that. host of the Intelligent Investor po Podcast, link to the podcast website in, bu in Business Insider, says this all because of targeted daily engagement. He didn't have to hire a PR company. He didn't have to cold pitch anybody. Just finding the people who are already serving the audience that you want to serve, help them to spread the word of their work and they will help you spread the word of yours. So four things, right? Number one, watering holes. Where do the listeners interact with each other? Number two, Instagram, where the listeners identify themselves. Number three, in the comments of your dream 100, that you're going to start getting dream guests way earlier than you ever thought imaginable. And then number four, by sharing the work of other creators, journalists, podcasters, newsletters, who will then collaborate with you and share you and your work with their audience. And you will start to see your downloads, your Instagram followers, your audience, provi provided that you actually add value, which we do here, but you know that's obviously another prerequisite. Um, you'll start to see 50, 100, 150% growth month over month. And that's all free. Totally free. That's all free. And That's amazing. Yeah. 15 minutes a day. Here's the other thing. People are like, oh, do I have time for this? Pull out your phone right now and look at the screen time app and see how much time you spent on social media. You have time for yes. this. You do. Yes. And I what's totally crazy agree. is that once we do that cleansing, social media is not going to be as enticing to just go in and just scroll, 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 scroll. Um, and so, you know, you won't be spending as much time. And the other piece I'll say is that a lot of podcasters spend tons of time on social media already, but they don't spend time engaging. They spend time publishing, creating audiograms, creating content, and they keep publishing week after week after week. But the thing is, because that audience on that social platform isn't growing at all, the same 100 people are seeing that post week after week after week after week after week, right? So, and by the way, you can only reach 10% at best of your following organically on these social media platforms. So, spend six hours a week making audiograms, making social content posts. Nobody sees it. Nobody engages with it. We are still going to post, you know, we're still going to create content, but take 15 of those minutes, <laughs> better 30, really 60. If you want to go all in and devote that to engagement instead of creating, actually making the content and your audience will go through the roof. Wow. I love that so much. Okay. So I have one question, <laughs> sure. Sorry, I totally which is, <laughs> oh, I love that. That is so incredibly valuable. You just gave us your, uh, all the training we ever really need to do. This. That's it. 
That's um, it. it. My, my one question is, um, when you're talking about your LinkedIn profile or your Facebook profile or yep. Instagram or whatever, is this a dedicated uh, title for Great your question. podcast or is this your personal or is it your business yeah. or what is it? Great question. So I think the context of the platform is super important. First of all, um, people are very wary of brand accounts on Facebook. So if you're on Facebook, it's got to be a personal account. Um, okay. On the other platforms, my general advice is by default, your personal profile, because people want to engage with humans. Um, and okay. really it's your brand as the host. That's going to, that's going to pull them in the only time there are some people who have personal brands who have multiple audiences, you know, like I do fitness and this and that, and my podcast is about fitness. Okay. I can see if like the, the fitness podcast needs to be its own separate thing. Um, but really the only time that I'm truly like, you should have a separate sort of, uh, profile or, or presence on the social platforms is when your podcast is about something that they already recognize. So for me, Philly, who like people from Philly know what Philly is. So it's advantageous for me to use Philly, who, uh, there's a podcaster in the accelerator who has a, a show about the esports video game league of legends. And so like, you know, if it was just Josh's profile, people aren't really going to know what that is. But if it's the League of Legends analysis podcast, if they're a League of Legends fan, oh yeah, okay, let's do that. So anytime it's attached and the show is about or attached something like a specific brand or place or something like that, then I think it's a good idea to use the brand account. But most times it's better to use the personal account. And that does mean that for a while, while you're doing this TDE, you're going to have to take a couple things out of your bio. And we all put multiple things. I'm the founder of this and the founder of that and the creator. And oh the yeah. Musician. I'm thinking about my own LinkedIn profile. It, it has right. to majorly be modified. And, and, and that's okay because we want to be seen as well-rounded and multifaceted individuals. Of course. So do I, like, I want people to know that I sing in a barbershop quartet. Right. But, but for the purposes of getting people to the point where they check out their podcast, that stuff is just going to, is just obstacles. They're, oh, oh, there's this. Oh, there's that. And a confused mind says no. And so really That's it's right. best to like, they will discover your nuance and they will discover all the incredible things that make you, you once they listen to the podcast. So we don't have to put it into your bio. Let's get it out of there and make it silky smooth from the time they land on your profile to the time that they click into your podcast. And then that's where we can show them all the other angles about us. Um, Love so, it. Yeah. Kevin, thank you so much. This has been absolutely amazing. So I mm -hmm. like to have a little fun. Yeah. Um, actually, I like to have a lot of fun. This is about the I'm most serious fun. I've been for quite a while um, <laughs> today. Yeah. So just a couple of little things um, that, I, that I'm just throwing out here just because they popped in my head as we were talking. Awesome. Um, you, not only can you have a podcast, you need to have a TV show. How many people have said this to you? No, you are nobody. so what animated. You oh, <laughs> oh my God. You are so animated. Number one, you sing, which I didn't get to hear. I was hoping that we'd have time to have you sing something. Number two. And all I can think about now that I know how to say your name, Schmedlin, is yep. you're the next Schitt's Creek. <laughs> Schmedlin, whatever. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> that is hilarious. <laughs> Maybe, uh, maybe I'm out. Maybe you could be the podcast person now that I'm going to go be on TV. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you, you're, I'm telling you, you're going to explode here in a little bit and you're going to have oh, your own so TV show. Thank I'm so serious. Much. That means the world. Oh my God. You're amazing. We'll be, hopefully we're, we're it's in the plan to do, to do some YouTube stuff very soon, <laughs> but, uh, I appreciate that very much. I'm blushing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, no. And, and you, um, you, everything about you, I admire and love. And, um, when I was thinking about the dream 100, I thought, you know, a lot of times you think, you know, who you want to have for that dream 100, but I'm going to tell you after this interview, you're my dream 100. Oh my gosh. Oh, what an honor. Incredible. So that's the thing. It's an exercise, right? The, and the list of the dream 100 is a living, breathing thing. And what's cool is that when you sit down and be like, I'm going to come up with a hundred dreams, usually you get to like maybe 15 or 20 and then you're like, who else? So it, you won't come up with it right away. Um, and it does change with time. So first of all, uh, thank you. <laughs> what an honor. Oh my gosh. Um, but yeah, it, it is, it's a challenge and it's, it's an exercise worth constantly doing. And what's cool is that when you do the targeted daily engagement, you're going to start to, you're going to start to discover people that you weren't aware of that align with what you're doing. And you're like, how did I not find out about this person? And then you add them to your dream 100. And then, oh my gosh, it's just, 
it, it's this self-fulfilling thing. And, and pretty soon, you know, if you start doing TDE, you'll discover that it's actually the most fun part, which is cool because it's what actually gets you new listeners and grows your show. So, but anyway, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. And then just one funny thing. Yeah. So, um, you know, I'm 64, my husband's 72. And I just had him listen to his first podcast ever awesome. at lunch today. We were sitting and he's today. like, you want to watch TV? And I'm like, no, actually, um, oh, he hasn't listened to any of my podcasts. Are you kidding me? That nice. won't be happening. Um, <laughs> this was George Clooney. And I know how much he loves George Clooney yeah. and he loves practical jokes. And George Clooney was talking about practical joke. He did. So I started it and I sat there eating lunch while he listened to it. And as it started going, he says, so is this just audio? There's n- I don't get to watch anything. Yeah. 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 Right. <laughs> right. Some people don't get it. <laughs> That's hilarious. And I was no. like, yeah, <laughs> it's a podcast. And he's like, I don't understand. It's radio, and I like said, so do you want to still listen to it? And he's like, I will, but I would rather not. I'm like, just forget about it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hey, it's not for everyone. Totally not for everyone. That's fine. That's totally fine. But oh, absolutely. It, Are you it. kidding me? My husband is not going to be anybody's podcast. Um, yeah. I can't tell me. you how many. People... I make up for all of it because I listen to all of them. Same here. I can't tell you how many people in my life, like family and stuff. They're like, so, so what do you do? Yes. <laughs> I'm like, I'm just on radio. Don't worry. I'm a radio guy. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. Just like I've uh, been, I've been doing what I do um, with the VA industry since 2001. And literally my family, um, <laughs> my family and, and my uh, in-laws just figured out the other day, they're like, oh, you have a real business. And I'm like, what do you think yeah. I've been doing since 2001? Right. 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 Oh my gosh. I'm there. And like, particularly now that I have a coaching business, now people are like, so you do podcasting and you coach <laughs> like <what? laughs> people pay you to tell them how to do podcasting. <laughs> I'm like, I'm telling you That's it's right. legit. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I know they don't believe it. It's hilarious. I, I get, yeah. But, but yeah. people who are in the world are just like, absolutely. You know, like, <laughs> but yeah, it's just funny that way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I know. Well, Kevin, thank you so much for being on here. I'm really thinking I need to probably have you come back. I'm here for it. Let's do part two. Okay. I love it. All right. So um, anybody that's listening, I want you to let us know, would you like to hear more from Kevin? Because if you do, I need you to comment and let us know. What do you want to learn from Kevin? What is it that you love about Kevin? What do you think the rest of his show should be besides Schmedlin? Because that has got to be a show. I'm telling you right now. <laughs> Midlands Creek. <laughs> right. Um, and Kevin, when people are like, I need to get in touch with you. I need to learn more. How do they do that? Yeah. So on, it's on all the platforms at Kevin Schmidlin, we'll give you the link for the show notes. Um, if you want to learn, if you want to check out the podcast, it's grow the show on all the platforms. Um, we're at growtheshow.com. And I also put together a hour long masterclass on how to grow and monetize targeted daily engagement, which I just taught is one of the four steps. Um, and so that's available at grow the show.com slash masterclass. I will be going to all of those places and yeah. downloading and binging and <laughs> learning from you more. And, um, if you need somebody to, um, pitch for you and say Schmedlin, needs a show uh let me know I'm here for it i got my co-signer <laughs> that's right get that's the signatures right. now that's, that's exactly awesome. right that's exactly right thank you so, so, but so, thank much. You so much kevin for being here all pleasure is all mine happy to be here thank you for listening to dare to leap say hello and access additional resources at virtualexperttraining.com there you'll be able to connect with kathy to share your feedback and join her community Join us again soon on Dare to Leap. Until then.